Um, so hello and welcome to today's Physician Spotlight. Uh, my name is Carolyn Newberry and I'm be serving as your host today. Um, I'm very excited to be sitting down with uh, Dr. Kishore Iyer, who is a professor of surgery and pediatrics at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, so Dr. Iyer, uh, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, thank you. And I was hoping we could just start um, by you telling a little bit about yourself. Ooh, that's already a long story, but uh, uh, I, I suppose to make it relevant, I'll start where I got into nutrition. Perhaps uh, one word describes it, serendipity. It was purely by chance. I've been a, a reluctant uh, uh, clinical nutritionist, I guess, if I could call myself that. I, uh, I was in the UK intending to do general pediatric surgery and return to India as a pediatric surgeon. Uh, by chance, I worked and trained with uh, Adrian Bianchi, who at the time was one of the leaders in uh, pediatric intestinal failure. And uh, what was uh, career changing for me was the opportunity to look after a young child, and I can take her name here because it became public record. Um, Laura Davis uh, was uh, the first child from the UK to get an intestine transplant at the time in Pittsburgh in the very, very early days. This was perhaps, I will be dating myself here, but 1992. Um, and it was relevant because her uh, uh, transplant, the cost of it, the ethics of it became national news and was debated in the halls of parliament and in public forums. And uh, and I was completely seized by this idea that this child who had spent all of her five years in hospital, uh, and unfortunately, as was uh, uh, common at the time, she survived about uh, perhaps barely a year after her transplant, but long enough to attend regular school, eat pizza, she said she would. And of course, the rest, uh, as they say, is history. I could not shake my... Uh, uh, shake the idea of uh, pursuing this area and hastily changed my career plans. Uh, did a spell of uh, basic research. I was a very reluctant researcher because I didn't, I feared becoming a rap doctor, as perhaps you can tell, I am a surgeon. <laughs> and I was very afraid that I'd become a rap doctor, which I didn't want to be. Um, but I did a uh, few years of research in London. Uh, on uh, TPN associated liver disease um, uh, happened. We got uh, lucky, perhaps. I had great mentors. We were among the first group to show that uh, phytosterols and lipid emulsion could cause uh, TPN liver disease. This was in the mid to late 90s. And, uh, and at that point, when Laura Davis came back to the UK, I thought, oh my God, I'd be wasting time as a pediatric surgeon. I'd have to do transplant and that doing test and transplant. Nobody was doing it in Europe. That's why I crossed the pond. And here I am. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's been a long and illustrious career thus far. And <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> right. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about more about um, the intestinal failure program that you work in and sort of your team players and how, you know, you typically manage these patients. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, it's uh, it is an important question, and it, it certainly, uh, if anything, um, it emphasizes uh, um, maybe if I've had any success, the success I've had is in bringing people together. Uh, and I I was a quick believer uh, in trying to understand my limitations, and and this might be an oxymoron, but but despite being a surgeon, I'm acutely conscious that I can't do everything and can't do everything well. So uh, if I there is one uh, contribution maybe that I'm most pleased about, proud might be the wrong word, but I started. Uh, Early in my transplant training, I ended up in Omaha, which, as you probably know, has a premier intestinal transplant program. Right. And uh, about six months into my uh, first faculty position in Omaha, uh, still dating myself in 2000, uh, I suddenly had an aha moment and I thought, who is looking after these patients who don't need a transplant? And, and obviously at the time, the answer was easy, nobody. And uh, I went to my boss and mentor, Alan Langness, a man with incredible vision, 
And I said, how about we start a program where I look after these patients who don't need transplant? And the first question to me half jokingly was, what's, what's going on? Are you not busy enough? Um, but but it really, he was quick to realize that that had potential. And we started initially with uh, uh, just looking after patients who didn't have transplant indications, but very rapidly to patients who were on long-term TPN. We created our first multidisciplinary program, nutritionists, nurses, social workers, surgeons, gastroenterology, hepatology, uh, which became the model in 2001, we reported at DDW, the initial experience of an intestinal rehab program. Um, I uh, moved on fairly quickly from Omaha, started a program at Northwestern, which I ran for four years, and then here uh, in Sinai. And our program here, we see about 150 new patients with intestinal failure each year. And uh, But we do, I tell patients, we're like a jiffy lube for the intestine. We can change the oil, we can tweak the spark plugs, we can change the whole engine. Uh, and I think uh, um, I see my role as being the general foreman who perhaps can triage what is the best treatment for an individual patient at the right time. Right. I mean, it sounds like you've had so many different experiences with different <laughs> environments and certainly different practice places, you know, Nebraska versus New York City um, and also in the Midwest. You know, do you, were you faced with any particular barriers to building these programs? And do you have advice for people that are trying to do the same in other institutions? <laughs> barriers, uh, little to none, perhaps, other than my own impatience. Um, uh, I, I those who know me will say I can get restless and bored very quickly. Um, I spent four years in Omaha, wonderful program. I'd gone there for a one-year fellowship. They uh, offered me a faculty position, which so I cut short my one year and started the faculty position at six months. Stayed there for about four years, learned a lot on the job from great people, and, uh, um, and then went to Chicago, left behind great friends when I left there again in four years, until a good friend and um, mentor, maybe less so, but a good friend who had uh, the benefit of taking the long view. She pulled me aside one day and said, I have a comment to make about the papers you write. They're all about initial experience. I said, well, since I move quickly, I can't write about the long-term experience. And she said, maybe you should think about staying put somewhere so you can take the long view. And that's good advice. And I would say in this forum, Aspen's a great uh, organization. Uh, you know, they have a, perhaps it's a somewhat cynical view that nutrition research could be better. There's a lot of good research in acute care nutrition in the critical care arena, long-term parental nutrition and fascinal failure, my areas of interest, this is an orphan disease, get scant attention, and these, pa these patients really suffer. And, and I think uh, Aspen's a good forum to network and what we perhaps, I've been fortunate, got good mentors early in my career um, who've continued and then stayed on to become friends and that's a good thing. But if you, what perhaps sometimes you lack in mentors, you can make up from a network of peers. And, and I, I uh, good friends of mine will say, I especially like the people who are critical. You know, we don't need yes men or yes women around us. Uh, the well-meaning critiques are in some ways more useful and I've been fortunate in that regard. Uh, our latest project, um, I don't know if you've heard of this, is called the Lift Echo Project and, and Aspen has been a really uh, wonderful partner in this effort, but, but I've been really for some time been bothered by the fact that there's quite obvious disparity in intestinal failure care and outcomes in the US for sure, and, and perhaps a view that uh, uh, home parental nutrition is in general better in Europe than here. I don't know if that's completely true, but, but it certainly I can see that there are gaps in care in the US. And so we started this project as a means to try and uh, the, the, the buzz phrase is democratize knowledge. And this was uh, certainly the clever idea was not mine. Guy called Sanjeev Aurora in uh, New Mexico came up with this idea of doing virtual clinics and using case-based learning uh, to master complexity. And that's what we did for intestinal failure. And that's been a wonderful exercise. We've just about finished our first year. 
Uh, we've done three modules, 24 virtual clinics. We've now got people signing into these virtual clinics uh, um, from 35 or so different states in the US, 15 different countries. At our last uh, ECHO clinic, we had a didactic uh, from Marion Winkler, past president of Aspen, who gave a talk on quality of life and intestinal failure. We had a great case presentation. We had Jeremy Nightingale from the UK give a didactic on the previous ECHO. It's been wonderful. At the last ECHO, we had over 150 individual participants. And I think there is a thirst for knowledge and uh, evidence-based learning and nutrition. And, and certainly organizations like Aspen help fill those gaps. Right. And, you know, I mean, I think that you segue into a lot of other questions that I have for many of the speakers um, in terms of how you progress a career over time and really grow and use, you know, professional organizations like Aspen to do that. Um, you know, if I had to ask you any, you mentioned a number of people in these answers that you identify as mentors. Was there one or two in particular that you found really shaped your career? And do you have advice in sort of how to identify those people? Yeah, in fact, I, I don't know if I'm qualified to give advice. It might be that I've just been lucky or people have been charitable. But, <laughs> but, but if I had to give maybe one piece of advice, I would say a... Uh, maybe now it's two, uh, a um, um, big believer in uh, Steve Jobs' advice, uh, keep looking at what really uh, sparks your interest, uh, then the obstacles will fall away. So, so I think that may sometimes take a little work early on. It's not so obvious what's interesting, uh, but you got to work at it. And if you get better at it, it gets more and more interesting. That's number one. And number two, don't be afraid to ask for help. And, uh, and I haven't. Um, and I have to say, I can't think uh, readily of somebody uh, who I thought was in a position to give advice, uh, intellectual advice, mentorship, or help, who turned around and said, nah, that's beneath me, or I won't help you. Uh, my own mentors, um, again, I, I could be dating myself generationally almost, uh, Adrian Bianchi in England, Louis Spitz, uh, Professor of Pediatric Surgery uh, in England, Lynn Howard in, in Albany was a, uh, has been a friend and well-wisher for a long time. And so there's an example of somebody who could be a mentor who you don't even actually work with, mentorship by association. And then yeah, I, I'm sure I'll miss people if I start naming names. Uh, Alan Langness and transplant, uh, perhaps. But, but in the areas of nutrition today, these are friends and colleagues. But I think mentorship need not be viewed in a very narrow context. Um, uh, I have, I, I, uh, I'm part of a program uh, that uh, mentors first year medical students at Sinai. And I just absolutely love it because um, mentorship is a two way paradigm, I think. And, and the astute student who asks a question that you can answer uh, is a mentor. And uh, um, I, I've had actually the opportunity to mentor high school students. And uh, we did a project about three years ago um, with a high school student. And the project was in mathematical modeling to decide the timing of transplantation in somebody with extreme short bowel. It was a purely mathematical paper. Um, and this junior in high school, 16 year old, presented a plenary paper in Argentina. She got a young investigator award from the Transplantation Society. Yes, I was her mentor, but really I think we both got in almost the same out of it. Uh, I have a young student right now who suddenly emailed me and said, you know, I was thinking of a project to do, will you help me? I want to look at racial disparities in access to transplant. This is so topical, so timely. Uh, we know it exists. Um, I might not, left to myself, I might have put that on the back burner and not done it, but now I've committed to her that I'll help her see it through. So, uh, so it's okay. I think it's okay. It's a very long-winded answer to your question, but I think it's okay to view mentorship in the very, very broadest sense possible. You can find mentors everywhere, uh, and they're waiting to be asked. <laughs>
And I think a lot of that also speaks to, you know, oftentimes we'll ask um, our more senior colleagues what advice they would give to, you know, trainees and junior faculty members. And it sounds like a lot of it is sort of identifying mentorship early and, you know, being in that bi-directional relationship with your mentor. And, uh -huh. um, you know, really- and it helps to uh, keep yourself honest, to keep you on your toes, uh, to, uh, helps challenge your own ideas and beliefs, and those are good things. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Continuing to grow and learn, like as we all like develop these careers. Um, and I guess you know we're getting to the end of the interview, but I was wondering, you know, if you had any final thoughts on things you're excited about within like the intestinal or rehabilitation community, or things we should be looking forward to um, within you know Aspen and nutrition in general. Yeah, I, I have to say, despite my earlier comments, I mean, some of the quality of nutrition research now is just so stellar. I, I, I think, uh, and, and perhaps it's fitting um, to remember Stan Dudrick, uh, who, who brought TPN uh, uh, and saved, uh, I don't know, countless thousand lives, um, that with his passing, nutrition research has almost entered a new phase. Um, and, and I think I, I can hope for uh, then in not so distant future, nutrition will become a mainstay. We won't be waiting in the wings to be invited and to be treated as important. I think, I think there is a growing realization that these nutritional issues are critical, fundamental to human wellness. And, and the research will have to proportionately get better. So it's coming. Uh, and, and for the young people in the field, I guess, um, or people looking to uh, looking around and saying, what should I do next? My advice to you would be nutrition as the blue water right now. It's open, there's lots of opportunities in research, intestinal rehab. The world, the world of intestinal rehab is in a very exciting phase. Intestinal transplant outcomes are improving. TPN outcomes are improving. There are newer lipid emulsions. Our understanding of liver disease is better. And then there's the whole era of growth factors that have just come on. And this is, we are just about scratching the surface. So I think, I think these are exciting times. Uh, uh, so I feel like uh, um, the next 10 years are gonna be very exciting and, uh, uh, and I'm glad to be, and hoping to be still around to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I'm sure you have a few, a few good years left. You know, as a practicing gastroenterologist that's just down the street from you, it's exciting to hear there's like new therapies that are coming out for, you know, patients that are struggling um, with this disease. And so I wanted to thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us here today in the Physician Spotlight. And, you know, we really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And thank you to Aspen, too, for this opportunity. Thanks again. Great. Thank you so much. Take care.